But my impression is that among the new the arrests that are being made now, there are still arrests. You know, the, the number goes up every couple days. Uh, there's a much higher percentage of felonies among the new arrests too, because they're finding, you know, the people that assaulted the officers. They've got, you know, the FBI has a list of, I think, 350 people they're still looking for, and the people that I think in the last 10 days I've seen six new arrests, and I think four of them were for assaults against law enforcement, something like that. So it looks like it's more. It's a higher percentage of felonies now. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, November 15th, 2021. Roger Parloff is a senior editor at Lawfare and the author of the recent article, What Do and Will the Criminal Prosecutions of the January 6th Capitol Rioters Tell Us? It is a deep dive on the demographics, the charges, and the adjudications of the Capitol riot cases so far. Roger joined me and a live Lawfare audience on Friday in the Virtual Jungle Studio for a Q&A with Lawfare material supporters. We talked about who the Capitol rioters were why some of them have been allowed to plead out to misdemeanors, what characterizes the misdemeanor pleas, and who is left among the bigger fish. It's the Lawfare Podcast, November 15th, Roger Parloff on the January 6th Capitol Riot Prosecutions. Roger, I want to start with the demographics of the defendant pool. This is a remarkable group of cases, partly because a single federal district court almost never gets 600 of the same related case arising out of the same incident. So what can we say, you've now looked at this body of cases, what can we say about the group of people who are being charged? Well, and I think I should say that my demographic analysis comes completely from the uh, George Washington University program on extremism. Uh, They've done uh, great work on keeping track of all of this stuff. I think we're up to about 659 cases federal. There's a, it's, it's over 675 if you include some of the D.C. Superior Court cases. And of the federal cases, the average age is 39. It's mainly men. It's about 80. I think it's about 86%. It's about 12% military people, former military, although one active military. The highest represented states uh, in absolute terms are Florida, Texas, and Pennsylvania. Per capita, it's D.C., Montana, Pennsylvania, and Kentucky. And they assure me that D.C. is a real number. It's uh, uh, it's a little hard. I mean, I know it's the most convenient spot, but I'm surprised to see it so overrepresented. And then basically, uh, there have been uh, about 126, at least 126 guilty pleas so far. So that's about 19%. The guilty pleas so far are very, very heavily uh, weighted toward the lightest cases, least serious cases. Yeah, so let's talk about the guilty pleas. Uh, You start the piece by noting that Chief Judge Beryl Howell seems annoyed by them. A lot of commentators seem annoyed by them. So roughly one out of six cases has pled out. Let's talk about what the cases that have pled out have in common. If you're a January 6th insurrectionist, what do you have to have done or not done in order to have had your case pled out? And what is it likely to mean for you? Well, we don't know for sure if the government is, if this is a conscious strategy, there's some evidence it is that they want to really get rid of the misdemeanor cases and focus on the felony cases. And so there's a lot of misdemeanor cases. Class A would be 
uh, misdemeanor would be the top charge that have been allowed to plead out to a class B misdemeanor, uh, which is um, something like a parading and parading, demonstrating, protesting in a Capitol building. And that's a maximum of six months. And approximately 75% of all guilty pleas so far have been class B misdemeanors. So that gets some people bent out of shape because it seems like, why are these people walking? And a lot of them are, in essence, walking. But I think it's it's probably sensible. These are the nonviolent people. And uh, uh, it's usually first offenses. They're often mitigating circumstances. And uh, it's obviously difficult for the judges and for the prosecutors, really, because you have this simply difficult situation. You have a violent mob, but a lot of the people in it are uh, sort of walk-ons and they play a role. Uh, If you're overwhelming the police, it's the numbers that allow you to do that. And, And so there is culpability in this event that is historic that did uh, you know threaten democracy and yet what they actually did is is not uh, what we would ordinarily punish very severely so there's a real uh, tension and uh it's be- being resolved i think in a sensible way but uh, maybe the only way and these are not people that are you know they're not pleading down from felonies that's an interesting point. You say uh, th- these are nonviolent and they're pleading down from misdemeanors to other misdemeanors. How consistently true is that? Is that a uniform rule? Are there exceptions to it? Well, of all the pleas, and of course, I wrote it when I wrote it, there were 150, 15 guilty pleas. At that point, I was aware of only two instances where there a felony had ever been charged. And it was usually, when you read it, you you thought to yourself when you read the charging document, why is this one being charged as a felony? Because it looks like all the others. And, you know, it could have been in the charging instrument, not not an indictment. So I I think it's been very consistent. 85% of the who've pled have been misdemeanors and 75% have been class B misdemeanors. Some of those A misdemeanors came down from a felony, but uh, that's that's where we are. Yeah. So the ones who pled down from a felony to a class A misdemeanor, what do those cases look like? There weren't that many of them. Often what happened was they were still nonviolent, but they got further into the Capitol. If you went into the Senate chambers, but were nonviolent, or you went into somebody's office, but were nonviolent, that probably earned you a felony charge, but you might have been allowed to plead to a to a class A misdemeanor. All right, let's get inside the head of Merrick Garland and the Justice Department team that is trying to create some degree of harmony in to make sure like treat cases are treated like is it fair to to infer from this that there has been a policy decision okay if you were there and trespassing and protesting but you didn't weren't involved in beating cops you didn't destroy property you didn't you know, dress up with antlers and and a cape, and you know, you know, you're not one of the 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 really iconic figures of the thing, and you didn't hurt anybody. We both, because we think it's roughly the right justice outcome, or because it's we think it's we're never going to be able to manage the caseload if we prosecute all these cases to a max. We're not going to insist on a felony plea, and we're not going to, you know, go to the wall to make sure you get as much jail time as possible. I think that's right. And it would also be futile, I, I, I should point out. I mean, the judges are, some judges are, are bent out of shape, but they don't really often, when push comes to shove, 
they don't impose greater sentences than the government is asking for, and often they go under. Yeah, so so let me ask you about that, because we've seen a number of cases now where, you know, judges have sort of uh, huffed and puffed, you know, hey, you guys are say this is the an insurrection, but you're letting this guy, you're not recommending any significant jail time. And, and then they come in and the government, and they come in under the government's uh, sentencing recommendation. How should we understand the behavior of the judges here? Yeah, that's a very strange thing. This is what Chief Judge Beryl Howell did recently. Uh, she spent a long time puffing and puffing and came in under the recommendation. She claimed that uh, she said that she felt that her hands were sort of tied by the light sentences given by other judges. I haven't really found that to be the case. The B misdemeanors aren't governed by sentencing guidelines. So there's uh, more discretion and they seem to be using discretion. Some people do get small jail time. It's been as much as six months, although that was a that was a special case. But usually it might be 90 days or 30 days, but then there's home confinement and then there's pure probation. And then there's some would, will give five years probation, some will give two months probation. And in fairness, you know, there, it's just like all criminal cases, the, the facts really are different. And the sometimes the criminal history is different. You know, one one had recently been released from prison on a uh, attempted murder charge. So, you know, he got a, a serious penalty, but most are not. And then, you know, sometimes they can be heard on their own. You know, they all recorded so many of them recorded what they were doing on on their phones. And uh, some can be heard, you know, urging others not to vandalize and and everyone gets credit for quickly turning themselves in and at least seeming seeming uh, repentant. Although some of the judges have been uh, a little uh, burned by that. It was the first the first defendant to be sentenced by uh, Royce uh, Judge Lamberth seemed repentant, and he gave her probation. And then she went on Fox and did not sound repentant. He's been uh, quite upset about that. Yeah, I, I would just say if there's one judge on that court not to screw around with, it's Royce <laughs> Lamberth, um, <laughs> having yeah. watched that court for a, a many years. So I'm curious about how Judge Roger Parloff would think about these cases. You said you think the Justice Department's judgment is to get rid of these cases is basically reasonable. I'm curious if you were a judge sitting on one of these cases or having reviewed a bunch of them, do you look at them and say the sentencing is basically reasonable, that it's basically too lenient, that it's basically too harsh? What's your instinct about the aggregate disposition of these cases? Aggregate, it seems about right. Every, every once in a while, there's one I, I say, what happened there? I, I don't, uh, there, there are some that are disturbing. And then, you know, it's clear that there are some, you know, some judges have different predispositions. There are, you know, there are reporters that are also steeped in these cases that have been uh, really observing every uh, sentencing, Alan Foyer at the Times and Zoe Tillman at BuzzFeed and some of the others. And they've, they've remarked on it's obvious that Tanya Chutkin is a little tougher. She's gone over the recommendation. Trevor McFadden has gone under the recommendation a number of times, at least a few times. Beryl Howell is, is sort of down the middle. But, you know, within the parameters of a B misdemeanor, it's, it's, a bit, it's, all, it's all fairly nuanced, you know, which is why there aren't sentencing guidelines to begin with. So... It makes sense. The thing I haven't, you know, mentioned there's a there's a huge challenge to the government that is also pushing these guilty pleas for the nonviolent cases, which is speedy trial rules. Not 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 for them per se, but for the serious cases, the people, especially the people detained. There are these speedy trial rules, and the challenge is that the discovery 
that they need to get to hundreds of defense counsel is enormous. The prosecution needs to turn over. There's probably never been a situation where a, a crime was so documented as this one was with an ocean of, you know, news media footage. You have 515 security cameras on the Capitol grounds. They've produced like 4,800 hours of video. You've got 900 uh, body-worn cameras on cops, please. And they've produced something like 1,600 hours of video. So all of this needs to be turned over somehow, terabytes of data. And meanwhile, you've got to do that while you're also uh, prosecuting hundreds of serious felony cases. And and I should say, in, you know, in fairness, there's only been a few felony sentenced, but they've gotten serious sentences. Yeah. So hold off on the felonies yet. Let's okay. finish up mm-hmm. with the misdemeanors. So j- just to make sure I'm understanding you on this point, the value from the government's point of view in getting rid of these cases, even at the risk of being somewhat lenient, is that it frees up prosecutorial resources to focus on the onerous problem of the 500 or so felony cases, some of which have significant speedy trial issues, but also significant discovery issues. Is that fair? That's right. I wouldn't say 500. I would say maybe, I would say it's about half of the total are felony cases, but but yes. And, and, and remember also that, you know, even when this happened, they were backed up because of COVID. And so it's a big office, but it has to do all the conventional DC crimes. And suddenly 650 cases are dumped on them and uh, with speedy trial obligations. All right. So let's talk about the much smaller number of felony pleas. How many have there been? And what can we say about them at this stage? I guess it's about 15% 15% of 660. And then only about three have been sentenced so far, but they've gotten eight months, 14 months, and then this week, 41 months. The um, 41 months was the first case of a uh, uh, somebody that assaulted a uh, police officer that was uh, sentenced. And that's that was a guideline sentence the low end of the guideline, but he was also the first of those people to plead. And again, it's it's a weird situation where he punched one guy in the face, but then there's no question he he had earlier helped rescue two police officers that were in trouble. So it's, it's very difficult sentencing decisions in fairness. And I think he was a military veteran as well. And, and no one knows which way that cuts in this case. Does that make it worse, uh, which the prosecution says, or does that make it, you know, is that, as it usually is, something in your favor? And I think um, Judge Beryl Howell, who uh, is an Army brat herself, as she said, uh, thinks it weighs in their favor. So the, the the other two who have been sentenced, what is a felony plea that nets you an eight months or 14 months that's not a violent case? Is, are, are these property destruction matters? One was extremely odd, and there have been two of these. One was a interstate communication of threat. And he came, you know, he came to Washington and he pretended to be at the Capitol riot and issued a great number of very violent threats against Nancy Pelosi and others. And he also had 18 prior convictions. So it was a pretty uh, unappealing case, but it was a very unusual case. Uh, There's one other threat case like that. And the other one, I'm afraid I just can't uh, remember at the moment, it was lower than the the prosecutors were seeking 18 months and they gave eight months. I can't remember the details on that one. Among the other guilty pleas 
are some very important things where we know this, the guidelines are, are quite stiff. For instance, for um, Oath Keepers, who were originally charged in a big conspiracy case that still has 17 defendants, they have pled out. Uh, they have not been given sentencing dates because they are expected to cooperate. And they are facing very substantial, you know, their guidelines, I can't say offhand here. And there are a number of other, there are other people who have pled to serious crimes of this nature. And there's a couple that are facing more than five years based on their sentencing guidelines. I think 10 are facing more than three years. So it's fair to say, based on the pleas already, that the sentences we've seen are the easiest, lowest value sentences, and the ones that are to come are likely to be the stiffer ones. Is that is that a reasonable generalization? Absolutely. And, and also, and this is unscientific, but my impression is that among the new the arrests that are being made now, there's still arrests. You know, the number goes up every couple of days. Uh, there's a much higher percentage of felonies among the new arrests, too, because they're finding, you know, the people that assaulted the officers. They've got, you know, the FBI has a list of, I think, 350 people they're still looking for. And the people that I think in the last 10 days I've seen six new arrests, and I think four of them were for assaults against law enforcement, something like that. So it looks like it's more, it's a higher percentage of felonies now in the mix. Okay, so let's talk about the cases that have not yet pled and not yet gone to trial. This is the body of cases. And by dint of the fact that the department is trying to clear its docket of the docket of the simple stuff, this is the harder stuff, the more serious offenses. What do these cases look like as a group? Almost 40% are charged with uh, a crime called obstructing, impeding, you know, corruptly obstructing influencing or impeding a congressional proceeding. And that's a little fuzzy. It's not unlike the uh, misdemeanors that have been charged in terms of the elements, but what earns you a felony in, instead of a misdemeanor is, is like I said, you, you, go, you go further into the, you go into the Senate, you usually are more uh, ostentatious, in your propaganda output on social media, both uh, before and after. So about 40% are those, but uh, about 210 are offenses against law enforcement. And those are very serious. And uh, at least 65 of those involve aggravating circumstances, inflicting bodily injury or um, having a dangerous weapon so those are uh, 20 year potential felonies, I mean, maximum. And then about 40 are conspiracy cases. And those are pretty interesting cases. Those are the, well, about 17 current oath keepers plus four that have already pled. There's uh, three cases involving Proud Boys. There's one involving some uh, three percenters. And uh, those are potentially interesting cases. And uh, you can see that the government is, at least with the Oath Keepers, they're going up the ladder, uh, trying to uh, get the higher ups, at least within that organization. Whether it ever goes beyond that organization is highly speculative at this point. So I'm interested in this intermediate body of cases, the, the ones that are felonies, but uh, they're felonies that are kind of aggravated examples of the kind of conduct that the misdemeanor cases reflect. So first of all, there's been some consternation among judges that this, this statute was not meant to reach uh, this sort of activity, that it's actually a you know, financial crimes statute. How stable do you think 
the legal landscape is for prosecutors on this. And, you know, to have a couple hundred of these cases riding on this statutory interpretation question seems a little risky, no? It does to me. Uh, I'm concerned about it. And some people are pleading guilty to just that offense. Uh, I might be wrong, but I, I think Jacob Chansley has done that. The uh, QAnon shaman. I, I think he pled guilty to one felony. I think that's the only one. I, I might be wrong. But uh, yeah, uh, judges uh, Randolph Moss and uh, Amit Mehta have expressed considerable concern about that statute. And uh, I suspect uh, there are a lot of motions to dismiss pending. I suspect that they will uphold it, those judges. But then the, the real question is, you know, what will the Supreme Court do? And uh, one of the uh, precedents there is, uh, I forget, something like USA versus Yates. It's a uh, case involving, a weird case, also involving a Sarbanes-Oxley law where uh, somebody threw back a fish as the, as the wildlife inspectors were approaching him. And was that uh, destruction uh, of evidence, uh, maybe not what they had in mind. So uh, I'm concerned about it. I, I, it does have a definition of proceeding uh, that uh, includes congressional proceedings. So I'm hopeful that that's clear enough. But no, it does. It seems quite risky. And of course, remember, there, there are two charges that we haven't seen. One is insurrection itself. I can understand that it's not just politically a hot potato, but it's also it may be hard to prove precisely what was in somebody's mind that did they want to overthrow the government or was it beyond a reasonable doubt. But the other one is a seditious conspiracy and uh, aspects of that statute. You know, it's rarely used the word, the text, at least. Maybe scholars will disagree with me, but the text, at least, isn't limited to attempts to overthrow the government. It's also attempts to um, hinder or delay the execution of a law, which is what this really was for a lot. You know, that is provable with a lot of people that that was the whole point was to stop to hinder and delay execution of the Electoral Count Act of whatever it is, 1887 or whatever. Right. I mean, it, w whatever the origins of the statute, it certainly by its terms seems to cover the conduct in question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ironically, I mentioned Sarbanes-Oxley law is a 20-year felony and uh, insurrection is a 10-year felony. <laughs> you know, so it, 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 it's sort of some irony in that, that they're going out of their way to avoid these other statutes and grabbing onto one that is itself pretty risky. All right, the floor is yours. Thanks, Ben, and uh, pleasure to be here also with you, Roger. Thank you, Bye-bye. So uh, there was uh, relatively little attention given to the level of education of the insurrectionists in the study you mentioned uh, in the article. So uh, what kind of role do you think uh, the level of education or lack thereof had with the people choosing to take part in uh, January 6th? I mean, were they high school, college graduates, or were they even, even PhDs in the, in the crowd? Well, I have no data on that. I have some hunches, but uh, I have no data. So without indulging pure hunches what what are you've spent a lot of time in these case documents what are your impressions i mean i think i think there's a lot of people have prejudices about who these people were to what extent do the case documents kind of validate those prejudices and to what extent is the story more complicated than that there there, there is a range but the cases i've seen uh, there were some fairly hard scrabble circumstances financially and, uh, you know, universal total uh, belief in the big lie, which uh, at some level, at least for the nonviolent ones, has to be sort of a, 
might be a mitigating circumstance. I mean, it wasn't just their president that was telling them to do this. It was practically a whole political party. There was this sense that Biden was uh, synonymous with communism. There were a few that had a sophisticated explanation for why they were there. They were they they sounded almost like Senator Hawley. You know, they were saying, "Well, it, the the state laws had not been were unconstitutional because uh, you know the state legislators' uh, prerogatives have been impinged." But for some, it was just you know they were there to protest anti-COVID measures. Uh, there were QAnon people. There were there were mentally ill people, and of course the educational backgrounds of mentally ill people could be very high. I think that the head of the Oath Keepers, who has not been charged, I think he's a Yale Law graduate. Indeed. Yeah, but I, I think he's a, he's gone in the Q direction. I'm really sort of I can't avoid just sort of speculating. Mm -hmm. That's fair. The floor is yours. Hey, I wanted to find out if I could a little bit more about interfering with Congress as being a chargeable offense. So it seems like everyone who, who attended the rally would have been aware that they were interfering with conducting the duty of the Congress. So, so isn't that something that should be a widely applied charge? And if it is, can you just, you know, again, explain a little bit about the details of, of, of that? So this is, just to be clear, this is the statute that Roger was alluding to earlier that is just the one that has a large group just above the misdemeanor cases. What is it that distinguishes the misdemeanor cases? Do they not meet one of the elements of the of that offense, or is it just that they seem like they're not that guilty? That's the other issue that disturbs Judges Moss and uh, uh, Maida, is that they don't see a limiting principle uh, as to when to apply the 20 year felony and when to apply the class A misdemeanor or or in fact the class B misdemeanor you know obstructing a congressional proceeding or, or very clearly violates the the B misdemeanor but when you would charge the felony is a touchy feely thing and uh, i mean i i think they've been using it in a sensible way but the judges don't want to say well let the prosecutors say, trust us, we'll, we'll use it appropriately. But there's no, there's no simple factual hinge which distinguishes the misdemeanor cases from the obstructing Congress felony cases, right? It's not, it's not like there's some factor that if it's present, you're in the felony land, and if it's absent, you're in the misdemeanor land. It would be corruptly. It's corruptly impeding. As opposed to innocently wandering in and thereby impeding? Like you were there yeah. for a protest, but, but you know, as the wave kind of moved, you moved with it, but they have no state of mind evidence that you were behaving corruptly? You don't need to prove it with the, the misdemeanor. Right, no, that's that actually seems yeah. like a real difference. Like if, you, if you've no. got, you know, Roger Parloff, who was kind of swept along, along with the crowd and ends up, you know, in the foyer. You can't really prove that he acts corruptly. He doesn't have any social media posts that says, you know, we're going to hang Mike Pence and, you know, stop the steal by, you know, making them open the fake ballots, not the real ballots. But if you've got Roger Parloff who's saying those things, they're actually differently situated, no? Yeah, I think that the, you know, if you look at the people being charged with the felony and the people being charged with the misdemeanor, it hits you as making sense. But explaining uh, why, you know, it's not like you can point to, you know, one used a dangerous weapon. You know, that's that's what prosecutors 
like, and that's what judges like to see. I understand the difference. Did they hit somebody? And, and that, that's not there. And so it's it's also a due process issue, not just not just a congressional intent issue. All right. We've got a bunch of uh, audience questions from people who do not want to appear on screen. Rachel asks, the January 6th defendant seemed to be getting charged with standard criminal offenses. If sedition and insurrection are crimes, are they in the penal code? Are they considered political actions like impeachable high crimes or abuse of power and don't really exist as criminal offenses? What makes them actions that can be prosecuted and whom? So this is a great question. Roger, take a stab at it. Well, insurrection is a a criminal offense in addition to being, you know, a constitutional offense. And the criminal, you know, it's it's in the Title 18 uh, of the criminal code. It's a real crime and it's prosecutable as a crime. And there has clearly been a decision not to prosecute people under it yet. Right. And, you know, I, I think a lot of prosecutors, because it gets into what's an insurrection and what's the difference between a riot and an insurrection. And did they intend to do whatever you would define insurrection as? And so... All of those are things a prosecutor would rather avoid. That doesn't mean it's a good reason to avoid them. The other thing with with insurrection, there's an automatic uh, bar from holding U.S. office. That's in addition, I'm not talking about under the 14th Amendment, there's a, it's complex, but if you participate in an insurrection after having taken an oath to, to uphold the Constitution, uh, then also you can be disqualified from office. But that makes it a very politically explosive thing. Still, the word insurrection has been used by prosecutors, at least in the early days of this. And it's been used by some judges, even in uh, rulings, not, not you know, in a fairly casual way, just describing what happened, but uh, it's out there. And then the, I think the more serious question is whether this will eventually be prosecuted as seditious conspiracy, which I think does make sense. And the the previous U.S. attorney, uh, acting U.S. attorney in D.C., Mike Sherwin, I think, did uh, say that uh, he thought it, it would eventually make an appearance. He said that in an unauthorized interview and then uh, was shortly thereafter uh, resigned. So uh, people have been sort of close to the vest since since that whole incident. The um, seditious conspiracy law did show up recently in a search warrant. One of the, the uh, general counsel of the Oath Keepers said that she got a search warrant to search her phone, and one of the uh, one of nine federal statutes cited was seditious conspiracy. So it's still in the ball game, and yes, that is a real. It's it's actually the next section of the uh, Title 18 of the U.S. Code after insurrection. Whatever the first is, the next is seditious conspiracy. And just to be clear, the seditious conspiracy law does have a uh, complicated and interesting history of application, which we have uh, spent a fair bit of time on on Lawfare. Jacob Schultz, our managing editor, has written a bunch of pieces historically about the use of the seditious conspiracy law, the most important recent use of it, or it's not that recent anymore, but is the conviction of Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman, the, the, the so-called blind Sheikh, and a bunch of his followers were all convicted uh, of seditious conspiracy in connection with the uh, planned a uh, reign of terror in the wake of the first World Trade Center bombing, and so this is a this is a real law that has real application, successful and unsuccessful, and I do think unlike insurrection, which as Roger noted earlier, the the insurrection statute has a weird quirk, which is that sentencing the maximum sentence under it is pretty light, and so some of the other statutes though they don't contain the word insurrection, are actually uh, more powerful prosecutorial instruments. 
And I did find, I, I found the sections. It's 18 U.S.C. 2383 is the insurrection. 18 U.S.C. 2384 is a seditious conspiracy. And if you look at the at 2384, you will find it uh, remarkably broad and quite on point. That is, you could easily see how some, though not all, of the activity in 1-6 could be covered by it. Uh, Richard asks, I have trouble believing that any convictions will have a deterrent effect. Do you have a sense of what, at the end of this process, the Justice Department wants the story of these prosecutions to be? Is it that the rule of law was honored? How concerned is the DOJ that 1-6 is effectively America's beer hall putsch? Well, I think they are concerned. I think 659 prosecutions speaks for itself. It's the, it's the largest federal investigation ever. And they are trying to get everybody involved, which seems to be at more than 2,000 people. And they, they recognize that general deterrence is important and uh, putting people through this. And obviously, a lot of people didn't expect this to be taken seriously or they expected to win. <laughs> I don't know what uh, or they expected to be pardoned. I'm not sure. But uh, one thing I left out in the beginning and probably should have mentioned, 80 percent, and this is according to the George Washington University program on extremism, more than 80 percent of these cases relies, at least in part, on evidence from social media, usually their own social media. You know, these all these even serious people that were battling with the police for hours would take time out and do videos of themselves and, you know, juxtapose arrows saying, this is me. And and even those that didn't post filled their phones with incriminating videos, which can be reached through search warrant and have been. So um, I, I think it's been a surprise to a lot of these people that this is a crime. Many are expressing remorse, obviously, but I think some of it is uh, legitimate. They're, they're also expressing anger at Trump for uh, having told them to go down there and then having abandoned them and, uh, you know, not having pardoned them. And uh, that's probably healthy, too. Auntie, the floor is yours once again. Thanks. So um, have direct substantial links between foreign social media misinformation campaigns and the January 6th writers been discovered? during the uh, criminal prosecution so far? Yes, there certainly are. I mean, uh, and of course, one of the most important things was Trump on Twitter saying, you know, go, go on January 6th, it'll be wild. That tweet was incorporated into advertisements, but in any event, it was something that you can see people referring to in texts in on Facebook posts. My president has said, it'll be wild. I need to go. When he says it'll be wild, he means he wants us to make it wild. There's some powerful stuff there. Uh, you know, I, I can't, in terms of statistics of the 650, 660, I, I don't know how many, but, and then of course, just the big lie itself, that is universal, that is universal. And that got out there, you know, largely through social media, but also Fox News and other uh, organizations. So uh, we're gonna close with a pair of questions from Diana, who asks, uh, what will it take to establish the truth of the January 6th events can we get there from here? I assume she means in the context of these criminal cases. And then separately, she asks, which I think is really a variant of the same question, will the reality of January 6th ever become the agreed upon narrative, the consensus that we all carry? Well, we have a, sort of an active opposition right now to accepting 
this narrative, which I don't call a narrative, it's the facts. But, you know, we saw Tucker Carlson has a three-part documentary out suggesting that this was a false flag operation, maybe uh, perpetrated by the FBI. And uh, Fox News is helping him propagate that. And very few Republicans are condemning it. Uh, just the usual people, Liz Cheney and Kinzinger and one or two, you know. So that's a that's a good question. Does does any of this get through? I I, I don't know. Now, uh, as far as will this, how how much clarity will the criminal investigations provide? It's one way of coming at this. Obviously, the congressional investigations are an important and maybe more important one. And then there's also a lot of civil suits, some brought by police officers, some brought by Congress people, and then the voting machine uh, companies, th those suits are shedding light. So there's a lot of different angles converging on the same thing. And uh, we hope that all together, historians at least, will understand what happened. But uh, we don't seem to be moving toward consensus. I don't see that. On that cheerful note, Roger Parloff, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Our audio engineer this episode is Hamza Situ of Goat Rodeo. Hey, guys. If you become a material supporter of Lawfare, you could be the next person asking the questions on these podcasts. You should, in any event, do your part to promote the Lawfare podcast on social media, leave us a rating or review wherever you found us, and buy our merch at thelawfarestore.com. The Lawfare Podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. And as always, thanks for listening.